Well, hello. In the last couple of lectures, we saw how the Gross, how Grassmannian geometry emerged and as a general feature of um, a description, a possible description of on-shell functions, which are useful in a wide variety of different quantum field theories. And in particular, in the last lecture, we saw how in the case of planar undecorated diagrams, so which are relevant for planar maximum supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory, that there's combinatorial structure really encoded everything that we needed to encode. The goal of this part of the series is to, is to show to you that this connection to Grassmannian geometry really has nothing at all to do with planarity and applies equally well to non-planar theories. And in the case of non-planar theories without supersymmetry or with super, maximal supersymmetry, basically goes through exactly the same way. And we're gonna show this correspondence now in a couple different ways. And, um, and I'll illustrate the ways in which, uh, or what the kinds of knowledge that we do have um, uh, about non-planar structures um, in the, through understanding Grassmannian geometry. So the title of this lecture is Stratifying Onshell Cluster Varieties. And by this, I'm basically coining a term, cluster varieties, I just mean, um, I'm not gonna have much time to talk about cluster mutations, but it's a very interesting subject. Um, but the, uh, this is the, the geometries inside the Grassmannian attached to these on-shell diagrams. And we're gonna start by, um, by reviewing what we've talked about before and this basic problem. To, um, and then we will build up this correspondence with Grassmannian geometry in two different, in a, well, actually three different ways, um, iteratively, to show you how even for non-planar graphs and even for non-planar functions, we can construct this Grassmannian Subvariety, um, submanifold, um, and then in the la third part, we'll talk about the um, what's known um, beyond the planar limit, and not much is the answer. So recall that we have these basic formulas for the three particle scattering amplitudes, and that means that if we we can start gluing them together in complicated ways, um, and in principle, the meaning of this kind of on-shell function attached to this diagram is completely determined by the three particle amplitudes that we have. And again, the rule that you are supposed to multiply them all together and integrate over the on-shell phase space of all the internal lines. And you could go about doing that, but you would pretty quickly um, discover that it was kind of um, annoying. For example, if you were to put this in Mathematica and say that momentum is conserved at every vertex and all the particles are on shell, you would immediately see but there's two solutions to momentum conservation and on shell condition at every single vertex. And yet the color dictates that you only care about one of those two solutions. And even if you were to pick the right solutions at every vertex, um, it would take you a long time to get from the expression you would generate in Mathematica say, to something as elegant and compact as this expression. And part of the goal of this lecture today is to understand more directly how we can go from these pictures to these functions, to these formulas, and what the geometric meaning is behind them. But I contend that if, if you really were to do this exercise in a few examples, the hard way, the old fashioned way, you would pretty quickly discover the Grassmannian connection yourself by out of necessity, out of simplifying your work. Um, and let me be clear about what I mean here. So recall this general expression that we have for massless particles in three in four dimensions, um, the, the all orders helicity amplitudes. Um, and when the sum of the helicities coming into the vertex are negative, um, then you have this blue vertex. And when they're positive, you have this white vertex. And in Yang-Mills theory, you'd have pluses and minuses, and you could decorate this, talk about this with arrows, for example. And so we'd have the three particle S matrix for three gluons, or three gluons, and the, depending on the helicities, you either have one in and two out, or two in and one out. But in n equals four, we get to ignore those helicity flows and just talk about these vert vertices without orientations to the graph, which is a great simplification. But, but one thing that it, I want to really emphasize here is that depending on the two solutions, for massless particles in, three dimension, in four dimensions, momentum conservation is fairly trivial in either case. Although it's a quadratic constraint on the momenta, it's a linear constraint in terms of the lambdas or lambda tildes. Um, and the actual form of the answer is very clear and very simple um, in either case. And so 
rather than talking about these quadratic constraints or this bifurcating set of solutions at every single vertex, it might be natural to, to bake into your language or your calculational apparatus the fact that these that momentum conservation is linear um, separately in the lambdas and lambda tildes at every single vertex. And that is one way that I think you would discover the Grassmannian connection. By introducing some auxiliary structure, we'll see it's a Grassmannian, um, in order to manifest the linear linearity of momentum conservation at every vertex, and also just to specify which of the two solutions we care about. So the idea is as follows. In any single diagram, you for every single blue vertex, you're going to introduce a little two by three matrix called B. And for every white vertex, you're going to introduce a one by three matrix called W. And instead of writing this simple formula, which is not that bad, to be honest, um, we're going to associate this auxiliary thing B, and we're going to associate it with this horrible looking expression. I promise it's not that bad. Um, and it really does simplify work um, later on. And then with this white vertex, every white vertex, instead of writing this particular function, we're going to write it in as close to this way as possible um, in terms of this auxiliary one by three matrix. And here I'm being consistent um, with my preferences about notation for the lambdas, the spinners, before, and namely that the upper index indicates the row and the lower indicates uh, uh, lower index indicates the column of the matrix. And these are little one dimensional column vectors, which is very silly to write the upper index, but still the point stands. And so instead of writing this function, we're gonna write it in terms of this auxiliary form this way. And I hope you already notice that there's a kind of a similar pattern between these two. All right, now before we start playing games with this, let me just define the terms and make it clear what we're talking about here. Um, and also to prove to you that going back this way, or that this formula really is the same as the left-hand side. And to do that, I really need to define what I mean by these volume forms over this auxiliary space. So when I write D two times three, so it's a sixth form modulo GL2 means, it's a sixth form modulo a GL2 transformation. This is, a, this is very much physics language for like gauge fixing. Um, and so it's a so it is a th six dimensional integral minus four um, um, uh, dimension. So it's a two dimensional integral because there's four gauge degrees of freedom. And here we it's, we have a three dimensional integral modulo GL one. So it's really a two dimensional integral to do. In both cases, they're two dimensional integrals. All right. Now, what are these little brackets down here? These are the consecutive minors of this matrix of the relevant matrix. So in particular, what I mean by this whole form in say in red is to pick a gauge and picking a gauge means pick some K columns of the K by N matrix to the set it to the identity. And then this is the minor involving columns one, two, and then the next one is two and three, and the next one is three and one. So it's a cyclic minors, it's very Park Taylor like. And the same thing here, although these are one by one minors, so it's a little annoying that I wrote them this way because I really could have just written W1, W2, W3 for minor one, minor two, minor three. Okay, so once you've picked a gauge, say you put the identity in this corner, then the first factor down here becomes one. And what you get for the second minor is B31. And what you get for the last minor is B32. Okay, so this is the actual form that I'm talking about. But you could have chosen this one or that one and it makes no difference. So that's what I mean by this differential form is pick a gauge and evaluate in that gauge. And that's and then that is the differential form that we're talking about. Okay, but I like this more gauge agnostic formalism in part because it lets us e more easily see the functions that we're talking about here. So let me show you how to get from the right-hand side to the left-hand side in both cases. So it's a two-dimensional integral and how many delta functions do we have? Well, first on the left-hand side, we have four delta functions in both cases, momentum conservation. And on the right-hand side, we have two plus four, but the eta's you can just ignore. We're just talking, of, this is there for supersymmetry and it's whatever the, whatever the right numerator is in a particular theory, if you care about a particular um, component amplitude. But in supersymmetric theories, I wish I had more time to review this notation, but this is just, just think of this eta tilde thing as being whatever it's supposed to be. Um, but this is, has a very specific meaning in n equals four. 
but we see that we have two times two delta functions here. So four delta functions there and two times one or two delta functions there. So we have six delta functions total over here and a two dimensional integral to do. And we have to soak up two of those integrals with this different, with this integral, or two of those delta functions can be used to soak, to do the integral. And it's obvious which two to do. So this tells this delta function, again, as we talked about last time, says that lambda is orthogonal to the orthogonal complement of B. Well, that is a very complicated way of saying that lambda can, or that B contains lambda. And if lambda is a two by three matrix and B is a two by three matrix, those two, those mean that B is equal to lambda, or at least when you impose these delta functions, the integral localizes B to be equal to lambda. And now it's very obvious. If you just set B equal to lambda and you replace, and now you've done all these integrals and you look at these minors, and then you replace B with lambda, you would get the left-hand side. So these two extra delta functions just lock B to be equal to lambda, and now you get the left-hand side. And then the second case, we have these two extra delta functions. And this tells you that W is the orthogonal complement of lambda tilde. Well, good, we get the, the argument that thing. Also, if you remember, the orthogonal complement of lambda tilde was this one by three matrix whose entries were two, three, three, one, one, two. And so these three minors down here just become the denominator appropriately. And then this becomes lambda's or the orthogonal complement of, or sorry, sorry the yeah, orthogonal complement of the orthogonal complement, which is the identity of lambda tilde. So this becomes momentum conservation. Okay, now I appreciate that at this point, you're thinking I'm crazy. Why on earth would I want to introduce these extra auxiliary things? Well, one reason is because now that you can see that this is a system of linear constraints, that is a linear system of constraints on both lambda and lambda tilde separately. And the form of these two little vertices is exactly the same. And that means that starting from um, a diagram that you'd like to build, if you attach these little two by three matrices and one by three matrices all over the place, and then you start gluing them together, you can build up a general form um, uh, for the entire graph that is exactly of this structure. And let me show you how that works in practice. All you need is two operations. And the first one is utterly trivial, which is that you can just take two on-shell functions. You don't glue anything together. You just put them next to each other and you say it's the product of these two functions. Well, what happens, so the, the two functions just multiply each other. And then the arguments of the coefficients of the etas just become block diagonal. Um, and where you had a, so K is the size of the matrices and N is the number of columns. And D is an interesting thing here. It's the size of the differential form. So you'll notice that on these three, these three point vertices, D is always equal to two. It's actually a two form and a two form. Okay. And the forms just wedge into each other. So let me show you what that means in practice. Suppose I wanted to construct the product of this sample of this on-shell function with this on-shell function. This is utterly trivial, I know. But we'd attach a little one by three matrix here and a two by three matrix there. And then we would just glue them together in the obvious way and construct a three by six matrix whose columns look like this. And the form just becomes, the, it used to be the wedge of these and this was the wedge of those. And now it's just the wedge of the whole thing. And a two form and a two form created a four form. So simple, simplest thing in the world. The second operation is much less trivial and it is amalgamation. And it takes a little bit of work to, it's a bit of a homework assignment that I'm not giving you as a homework assignment to show what it, what, what it means to, inter, to set the momentum of leg I to be minus that of the momentum of leg I prime and to integrate out over its degrees of freedom. But I will just tell you geometrically what happens. What it does is it takes every single column in this matrix and it projects it onto the complement of the sum of the two columns that you glued together. So that means you take the sum of this column and this column, and then that's a one vector in three dimensions. And you take the, in Mathematica, you would say the null space of that one three dimensional vector. And you project every single column of this matrix onto the complement, onto that null space. And thereby you get a two by four matrix. So when you do this, 
the columns of C get projected onto this complement, uh, the complement, or it's modulo the sum of these things. And K, the number of rows goes down by one. You project every three vector onto a two dimensional subspace. So you go down by one in this example. And you always lose two columns when you do this. So you, you N goes down by two. Now, when you do this, there's always one little extra gauge uh, redundancy, which is where you pick, you could think about the A plus B is spanning a one dimensional space or a projectively one dimensional space. And the orthogonal complement is not uniquely defined uh, or it rather is invariant under scaling. So there's an extra scaling. And that means that you lose one form, um, one um, degree of freedom on the form. And in this case, you can just kind of close your eyes and delete this WI and you'll get from a four form down to a three form. So what that does in practice is you get from this three by six matrix to that two um, by four matrix. Okay. And by doing this iteratively, you will always construct a representation of any on-shell diagram, whether it's planar or non-planar, doesn't matter, of this form, where the forms get glued together iteratively um, um, in this simple way. And every time you lose one degree of freedom and the, the form of the delta functions of the constraints never changes. Here I'm putting the fermionic delta function as part of the form, but it doesn't need to be viewed as part of the form. So this is the, the claim that we started with at the very beginning of these, this lecture series, that there is this correspondence between on-shell diagrams, and this is now a construction of it. You can attach these little forms to every vertex and build it up. There are a couple more operations that are pretty useful if you wanted to start playing this game. And one of them that's not, it's not very general. It's not general enough to build up all diagrams, but it is um, um, uh, surprisingly useful. When it works, it works beautifully, which is attaching a bridge between legs A and B. So this is when you take a graph and you glue a bridge between the legs. And when you do that, the column B, so this is always a um, white to blue bridge. Um, uh, so that means that there's a white vertex attached to leg A and there's a blue vertex attached to leg B. Um, this has the effect of shifting column A or column B by some new variable um, proportional to column A. It keeps you inside the exact same matrix. So every col the size of the matrix stays the same and the form gets added a, D, a, a wedge of a D log alpha. And so you gain one new, this little D here stands for the number, the dimension of the form on the Grassmannian. Um, I didn't give a formula for it, but it's very easy to see that what this is from, from this discussion right here, that it's two times the number of vertices minus one for every internal line. That's the formula for the D, little D. Okay, so just to illustrate how this works, we can start with a empty graph like this that we saw last time. And we talked about last time how it was just represented by a bunch of delta functions. A delta on lambda tilde, if it's a white vertex and a delta on lambda, if it's a blue vertex. This just tells you this is the on-shell function where all the momenta is zero. Now that's where it has support. Um, so this is the C matrix we'd attach to it. Um, and then once we wrote the C matrix, it would be represented in this form. Well, if we were to attach a bridge, say between legs one and four, we shift column four by column one. And if we shifted and we added a bridge here, we would shift it there and we could keep going. And you can see that you generate, you iteratively construct this matrix C as a sequence of shifts. This makes it very easy and usually gives rise to a very elegant looking um, matrix or at least a parameterization of the matrix and you'll notice that in this case these variables and those variables are trivial just for the sake of um, the, some of the examples we're going to see it's worth pointing out that um, just like we saw last time that the bivalent vertices can always be deleted they don't mean anything they're one for both white and blue so you can add bivalent vertices as much as you'd like so when you look at this graph you can delete all of the bivalent vertices and what you're left over with is obviously the left graph. Now, you didn't need to get the exact same matrix or the even the, because they could have been parameterized very differently. Um, the equivalence between forms does not dictate what coordinates you're using to describe those forms. Um, okay, there's one other way and this will be on your homework. So it's worth uh, paying attention to it. 
um, to directly construct this matrix C as quote unquote boundary measurements um, associated with the graph. And the first step to, to construct a boundary measurements is to give the graph what's called a perfect orientation. And there's a beautiful story in the, about the combinatorics of perfect orientations for two colored graphs that I'm not gonna talk about. But if you're interested, you should Google the word Castellan, for example, or look up some of the papers by um, Sebastian Franco. There's a, there's a really nice story about all of the possible orientations. Um, I mean, I'm giving credit to Sebastian Franco for an old mathematical result, but he describes it very beautifully in this context. So the first thing is to pick an orientation for the graph. So to just decide, I know that n equals four doesn't really have any arrows in it, but for the sake of this construction, draw some arrows such that every white vertex has one in and two out, and every blue vertex has two in and one out. So construct that orientation um, or just give it an orientation. And then weight the edges of the graph um, by some variables, give them edge weights. Um, and in fact, in this graph, I really should be giving a weight to everything, um, but there's always a, a redundancy in this because you can set a very large, actually in general, a pretty large number, all but D of them, in fact, to one. And I'm not gonna talk about which ones you're allowed to set to one. But let's suppose that, in, that we've weighted the edges of this graph as, as drawn and every undecorated edge, so like this edge here is, has weight one. Okay, so this is an edge weighted oriented graph. So the way that you construct this matrix is very straightforward, very simple. The first point is that you put the identity matrix in the columns associated with all of the sources. So in this case, four, five, and six are the sources. And so you put the identity matrix in those columns. And now <clears throat> for all of the other columns in the matrix that you have to, or all the other entries in the matrix that you have to fill in, what you do is you write down the sum over all paths and the product of the edge weights along each path. This is something that's easier to say in words than it is to write in an equation. So for example, if we wanna look at this entry here, which is the, um, which would correspond to paths from four to column one, or which is in the graph from um, leg four incoming out to, so you look at all the connections between the sinks, or the, between the, from the sources to the sinks. So this one here, um, it's a sum over all the paths. And there's one path here in red that goes along this edge and it's one times one times one times one times alpha five. So you put alpha five there, but you look for all the other paths and there's another path here, which goes this way. And it's one times alpha eight times one times one times one times alpha five. So it's alpha five plus alpha five times alpha eight. And you keep going. So for four goes to two, you look at all the paths. And in this case, there's only one path. And it's the product of all the edges along that path is alpha two. So that's all you write there. And for um, four goes to three, it's just alpha eight, alpha six, alpha seven, and that's what you get. And you can continue this exercise to fill, fill out the entire graph uh, matrix. And that is the C matrix for this form, uh, for this on-shell function. And the differential form in supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory is just the wedge product of all of those edge weights that you wrote down. Um, and you can remember the equation for D, which was twice the number of vertices minus the number of internal edges. In this case, D is equal to nine. And um, in general, if you were to give every edge weight, you'd have um, number of internal lines, uh, extra redundancies. Is that right? No, you'd have, anyway, you'd have D, D minus that number. Um, Notice that I'm allowed to give the uh, edge weights to the external lines here too. Anyway, in the example for your homework, I'm giving you a graph with particular edge weights and a particular orientation, and I just want you to construct this matrix. And then this gives you the formula that you'd like. You might wonder, what happens if I didn't have maximum supersymmetry? What if you were considering something in Yang Mills, pure Yang Mills theory, just gluons? Well, there you have to care about these kinds of, these orientations aren't optional, they're not, a computational device, they're part of the description of the physics, which is what helicities are you asking for? Which are the minuses and which are the pluses? And in that case, all you do is you take exactly the same result and you multiply it by the determinant of one minus the adjacency matrix for this graph. And you raise that to some power. 
And so it's interesting that for non-supersymmetric theories, the answer is exactly the same as in supersymmetric theories times a factor that just is raised to the number of supersymmetries minus four. So it's a very simple kind of decoration. Um, and the question about all of the different factors like this that are associated with a given graph is largely unexplored. It's an interesting open problem for further research. The number of perfect orientations is very well understood, but most perfect orientations do not affect this factor. For example, in this case, uh, debt of one minus the adjacency matrix is equal to one, and which means that the answer in n equals four is exactly the same as it would have been in n equals zero. Okay, so we've now seen a few illustrations of this kind of correspondence that this omega depends a little bit on the theory. It depends on um, the forms that you're attaching to every one of these little three particle vertices. Um, but this, there's, in terms of this auxiliary structure, this auxiliary C matrix that you built out of all these Bs and Ws, um, the, you always have these bosonic constraints, which are two per particle always. So it's two N delta functions. And four of those always encode, encode momentum conservation. Why? Because the constraint that C contains lambda and that C is orthogonal to lambda tilde implies that lambda and lambda tilde are orthogonal, which is momentum conservation. So let's just kind of enumerate some general characteristics of this correspondence. So what the different parameters that appear in this formula. N so the si this is this matrix C is as a K by N matrix. N is the number of external legs, obvious enough. K is the number of sources in, an in a perfectly oriented version of the graph. Um, and for a trivalent graph, it's two sources per blue vertex plus one source per white vertex minus one for every internal edge. So this is the formula for K. Um, it's obvious that the number, if you think about this gluing amalgamation process, how big is your matrix? Well, it's two per blue, it's one per white. You glue everything together, and then every time you delete an internal edge, you lose a row. So that's K. Um, D is the number of coordinates that you have. And remember, it's two per vertex minus one per internal edge. And again, this is formula is actually only valid for trivalent graphs. And I've only been drawing you trivalent graphs. Um, well, at least sometimes I've given you bivalent graphs, um, but that's, is, yeah. So I, I mean, once you've removed all bivalent graphs, but there is a natural generalization of this story where you take, because of this merge relation that you can take the same colored tree of uh, a tree of same colored vertices and rearrange it in any way, it's very natural to consider graphs where you collect all together, all the vertices connected into a tree. And in that case, so another way you've, 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 um, re eliminated all of the black to black or white to white edges in the graph. And then when you do that, these formulas get general, get changed a little bit. Um, this formula is true in general, um, which is the total number of edges of the graph, including the, so the external number of edges, that's N, plus the number of internal edges minus the number of vertices. That's always true, even if you've made it bipartite or whatever else. Okay, the, the number of delta functions beyond momentum conservation is always 2n minus four. We've already talked about that. So that's how many delta functions there are to constrain the internal degrees of freedom C of C. Notice that when k is equal to two, um, when k is equal to two, these constraints, in particular this constraint, two times n minus two of this, so you're looking for a two by n matrix C that contains lambda. Well, that always ensures that C is equal to lambda. And so for K equals two amplitudes um, or on shell functions, this whole C matrix business is a really stupid way of just talking about lambda, the particular two by n matrix lambda. Um, but more generally, that's not the case. Um, C has to contain lambda. It's not always equal to lambda. So, one of the interesting things is that the dimension of the Grassmannian is always k times n, it's the number of entries of this k by n matrix minus k squared by, um, for GLK. So it's k times n minus k. That's how many degrees of freedom there, there um, could possibly be inside this Grassmannian. Um, and notice, and then in particular that implies that if D, so the number of coordinates, this number can grow arbitrarily by adding edges to the graph. Right. Every time you add an edge, you add two new vertices and three new internal lines. 
So that means that, that D goes up by one every time you add an edge. Um, and so by take, starting from any seed graph, you can keep adding edges forever and you will increase D arbitrarily large. However, the dimension of the Grassmannian is bounded by this. Um, and that means that whenever D is very large, so for graphs with many, many internal edges, um, what it means is that some of these coordinates must be degenerate or that the form, differential form is degenerate. The, the size of this form, the number of independent variables sitting inside here, or the rank of this form um, is bounded above by D, by, by the dimension of the Grassmannian. And it is worthwhile to define this, um, uh, uh, a notion of reducibility, which has very noth nothing at all to do with planarity or permutations or anything else. And we can call a diagram reduced if the number of coordinates D, which is readable from the graph, it's the no total number of edges minus the number of vertices. Um, if that is equal to the dimension of the space spanned by this in, in this um, uh, you know, boundary measurement matrix say, then we say that the diagram is reduced. This is a worthwhile definition in part because D is D is very, of a given graph is very easy to compute. And the dimension of the Grassmannian, you can do that even if you add edge weights to every single edge. And the reason is because it is just the rank of the tangent space um, in these coordinates. So what you do is you take, you decorate every single edge in the graph with some weight, and then you compute the, the, the tangent space matrix so you take the partial derivatives with respect to every single variable, and you get a matrix of partial derivatives. Um, is, is you're constructing the tangent space, and all you need to do is compute the rank, and that's equal to the dimension of this submanifold, at least at a point. Um, and so if, the, if D is equal to dim of the dimension, then it means that your volume form here, omega, is, is a, um, a non-degenerate differential form. Um, and then we call the diagram reduced. This is worthwhile because it means it's, this is very easily testable on a computer. We'll come back to that. And it's clear that the number of reduced diagrams is trivially finite for any fixed n, k, and d. Now it's known, it's trivially finite. Why? Because you cannot create, you cannot add arbitrarily large numbers of edges. You can only add so many edges. Um, and all the graphs with that number of edges um, uh, only some of them are going to be reduced. But anyway, you started from a finite list and you cut it down by some number. It's, it's still a finite number. Um, and so, because just because the number of graphs is finite um, with a bounded number of edges. So the number of reduced diagrams is trivially finite. That does not mean we understand the number of them, but that is the, um, but it's a triviality that it's finite. Okay, so I want to tell you a little bit about what we understand in the case of non-planar graphs. Um, outside of the case where we have access to these permutations and all the combinatorial power that we have for planar theories. And the, the first place to start might be the case of k equals two, in which case we're, again, this whole C matrix business is really just a long winded way of talking about lambda. Um, and in general, we don't want to have any constraints on lambda. And so we're looking for top dimensional varieties of G2N. And this is something that actually was understood classically, I mean, or at least a long time ago. And I'd like to explain a little bit about how, um, uh, about the geometry attached to a diagram like this. And again, K is twice a number, twice per blue vertex. So it's four times two, plus one, two, three, four, five, six times one, minus the number of internal edges. And I claim that that's equal to two. Um, so it's something you can always read off about the graph. And it's simple to see that for any top dimensional, just basically what I just walked you through, shows that the number of blue vertices has to be um, two less than the number of, ed of external edges. So any graph that meets this criteria, um, if it's reduced, um, has this number of blue vertices. And that every blue vertex must connect exactly three distinct external edges. Why distinct? Distinct through um, arbitrary chains of white vertices. Okay, so then you can add white vertices all over the place. The first point, why three? Um, um, if it connected more than three, then the, this would imply a constraint among the lambda tildes. And if it were connected um, 
uh, yeah, through chains of white vertices. Um, a constraint among the, that's definitely true. Um, yeah, so you walk out, well, anyway, each one's like a little MHV three-point amplitude and it connects exactly three particles, okay. And that means that we can label a diagram. Now, this isn't really capturing the geometry yet, but we can means that we can slightly redundantly, but still talk about this diagram in a combinatorial sort of way by instead of drawing the picture, by just listing the triples of legs attached to every blue vertex. And so here we would say it's like one, two, three for that vertex, two, five, and six for that vertex, um, three, four, and six for that vertex, four, five, and one. Now, each one of these little triples contributes one row of the n minus two by k matrix, which is the orthogonal complement of C. So C perp, um, which is the complement of the lambda plane, is constructed by all of the little three term identities that you can construct by three vectors or by two dimensional vectors. If you have two, a generic set of two vectors, any three of them will satisfy a relation known as Kramer's rule or Schouten identities, um, which simply give you the rule for how to take a random two vector and decompose it into a basis of any other two. So that three term identity is kind of simple and it's easy to remember it, which is that any this determinant times the first two vector plus this determinant times the second two vector plus this determinant, notice that they cycle around, always equals zero. So this sum, it doesn't always cycle, but for two, two by n matrices, it cycles. Also for even by n matrices, it cycles. Um, more generally, you'd have to write minus signs and stuff like that. All right, anyway, that means that you can view this as like literally a little three point MHV amplitude where the rows of this matrix are just the particular um, thing that annihilates the lambdas. So it's a particular um, vector in the complement of lambda um, that's built out of the, th the corresponding three elements. So this is one row. The next row you generate this way, two, five, and six. There's one unique three-term identity among these three two vectors. And this, these are their coefficients. And similarly for three, four, and six, and for one, four, and six, one, four, and five. And what is the on-shell form? What is the function that we get? It is simply the product of all of these little three by th these little three particle amplitudes. It's just all of those in the denominator, all of those, all of those, and all of those. Very simple. And this is the this is the on-shell function. But you'll notice, and I hope you notice, that there is a one slight distinction here relative to what we normally would like when we write an on-shell function, which is namely that this C star, which is the orthogonal complement of this, is not exactly lambda. And normally we'd like momentum conservation to be lambda dot lambda tilde instead of some whatever this thing is. And to fix that, we actually need to pick a gauge. And anyway, this change of variables between C star, which is the perp of this, and lambda, the matrix lambda, costs you a factor here in this, it's a Jacobian of this change of variables. So this is, this is how you can construct those formulas like I showed you before for that nine particle example. Okay, now there's another way of understanding these formulas. In fact, um, of uh, also showing a basis for these things by thinking about the geometry encoded by these little diagrams much more geometrically. And that's to go back to that picture that we had before. We, we studied it in detail for the four particle amplitude. But the point, the, the point here is that is to think about what is this form or this function? It's a differential form on the kinematics. But what is this sequence of adjacent minors mean geometrically among the columns or the spinners lambda? Well, it means that there's a pole every time an adjacent pair hits each other. And we can think about this geometrically, or at least we can visualize this geometrically as having lambdas living in, in P1 um, to talk about this uh, geometry. So instead of two vectors, we can think about them as points in P1. And in particular, why not think of them as real? There's no reason why not. So we can think about this as, as points in RP1. And in RP1 is just a circle. 
And we can see that, the, that this differential form is exactly the thing with logarithmic singularities located at the boundary of configurations of ordered points on a circle. This is why this factor comes up a lot in string theory and many, many places is because of this um, connection between differential forms and these locations of these, uh, of these geometric, of poles and these geometric configurations. Okay, so that means that, that this Park-Taylor factor is somehow uniquely attached to the configuration of six points ordered on a circle. Um, and it's obviously cyclically symmetric. But we can look at, uh, say, an on-shell function like, or an on-shell diagram like this, which is just some four-particle amplitude with weird ordering. And you can see that the, if we label the triples, um, one, three, four here for that vertex, and three, two, four, we can view each of these little triples as imposing the consecutivity along the big circle of one, three, and four. So one, three, and four have to be cyclically ordered. And the next one says that three, two, and four have to be cyclically ordered. And that has a unique answer, and it's the Park-Taylor um, involving part of, uh, it's the Park-Taylor geometry of these four ordered points. However, this is where it becomes kind of interesting, is that there is no reason why we had to list the triples in any particular order. If we're talking about non-planar graphs, there's no reason why the leg one, we needed to read everything clockwise around here. So for example, maybe you, you wrote the first triple as one, four, three. Well, now there's actually two different options for how to order this. The one, four, three being cyclically ordered and three, two, four being cyclically ordered. There are two possible configurations that are consistent with this total ordering. And so we could say it's this or it's that. And what is the geometry attached to the, um, the union of these two things? It is the sum or the form attached to the union. It is the sum of the two forms. And that means that we can say that this part Taylor is equal to minus the sum, minus sign because we flipped one triple to the sum of these two things. And that's a very interesting non-trivial identity among part Taylor factors. But it immediately live, gives rise to a simple geometric statement for any particular on-shell function, which is uh, for these MHV functions, which is namely that the particular function in question is the sum of all part Taylors factors such that the arguments are consistent with the, or, with the arbitrarily chosen ordering of every single triple. Um, and that is a concise, correct, it's not very concise because it gives you a sum of many terms, but it makes the simple pole structure, for example, very manifest. Whereas in some of the previous formulas like this formula here, it's not so obvious that, let's see, we can find a pair here that repeats, I'm sure. Um, there must be, well, maybe not. But it occasionally can happen that you can have double poles and things like that here. And it's a very non-trivial fact that every double pole is canceled by something happening magically in the numerator. But once you see that it's a sum of simple park Taylors with simple poles, you know that there are no double poles in this expression. It also allows you to think about geometrically um, things like the KK relations and U1 decoupling identities. This is the U1 decoupling identity, which is that you start with the planar graph and you order the triples in this kind of obvious way. And then you just flip one of them and you get this decomposition. So this is a geometric understanding of things. And also the KK relations um, come from flipping uh, many of the vertices of the triples attached to um, um, this particular diagram, for example. OK. Um, OK. So what do we know? There's so much for MHV. We still don't know, and it's worth pointing out that it's an open problem to answer the question of like how many differential forms exist? How many different on-shell diagrams give different differential forms? We know from the story that we've just told that the Park-Taylor factors, modulo cyclic, um, so um, modulo Zn, um, uh, cyclic rotations, and also a flip actually, there's also a flip symmetry here. Um, that those form a basis of all um, uh, of all differential forms needed to express any on-shell diagram for MHV. So we know that that's a complete basis, but we don't yet know, but it, that doesn't answer the question, how many different diagrams are, how many different functions are there? You know, if, I, if you start drawing lots and lots of diagrams, how many different things do you get? How many different elements? We know that number is bounded 
um, it's bounded at it, it's at least as large as the number of ordered partailers, which you can get by just taking a planar graph and then sprinkling around the edges in lots of ways. You at least have all of those. Um, but uh, how many distinct ones exist? Nobody knows yet. Okay, but beyond m equals k equals two, um, it turns out that it's a very hard problem and for several interesting reasons. Um, the, but the basic idea is kind of, should be kind of clear. If you want to understand this classification of, of these on-shell functions that you can get for, um, for more general, for k equals three or something like that, why don't you just draw every single diagram you can draw? So everyone that's possibly reduced, check how many of them are reduced and see how many of them are different. Okay, well, good luck. It's not as trivial as it for, at, may appear at first. And the first reason is, well, maybe trivial, but it's a serious one, which is that, that even for k equals three and equals six, which is the first case, we're talking about like 17 million different diagrams that you can draw that are all plausible, but possibly reduced. Okay, now for every one of those diagrams, you still have to answer a question, which is how many of them are the same? And that is actually a real in interesting subtlety um, because in the case of MHV where we had n hat delta equals zero, so this whole Grassmannian was just a way of saying lambda, all we needed to do was to, to see that two functions were different was just to evaluate them for some spets values of lambda. However, when, when you have some internal degrees of freedom available to you, the comparison is now between differential forms. And it's a much harder question to ask, does there exist a diffeomorphism of these coordinates into those coordinates? This is a very non-constructive, difficult problem to solve. So merely computing them as functions does not at all suffice to answer the question. Of, once you've generated the 17 million diagrams, it's actually much larger, but that's a number, that's an easy upper bound on, on how many could be reduced. Um, just go ahead and um, and you still need to answer the question of, among the ones which are reduced, which ones are fundamentally different? And um, to do that, you would have to actually construct, um, uh, or at least to do that naively, you, you'd, you'd want to actually construct a diffeomorphism from one subspace to another subspace. And so although the maps from a diagram, well, if I handed you a diagram, you can easily construct the C matrix um, is direct and very easy to implement, it actually isn't very unique. And the problem is that it depends on which edges you chose to label. Um, and identities among graphs change those variables in, in interesting ways. Those things are called cluster mutations, but we're not talking about that right now. Um, and it can be very difficult or, to construct, identify diffeomorphisms between different versions of, of the same functions. Okay, so to actually make some progress, um, my collaborators and I, particularly Sebastian Franco and Daniel Galoni and I, and Kung Kao Wen and I, um, decided to, to uh, tackle this list of 17 million things. And we tried, to, we, we tried to reduce it to problems that we understood very well. And I want to be very clear about the definitions and what we're talking about here um, to, um, to, uh, to classify the, the things for G36, just, just for six particles in K equals three, and MHV six points. The first definition we've already seen, which is that a diagram is reduced if and only if the dimension of the subvariety, which again, you can compute by the rank of the tangent space, is equal to this number D, which is twice the number of vertices minus the number of internal edges. And then we'd like to say that two varieties, this is a almost contentless definition right now, but two varieties are isomorphic if there exists a volume preserving diffeomorphism between their coordinates. Okay, now that doesn't, it's not very constructive yet, but that tells you that two things are the, going to be the same. And then we have some conjectures. First is that two varieties are isomorphic if and only if their diagrams are related by square moves and mergers. This is something that we've actually now exhaustively checked for all the six particle graphs. Um, I still haven't told you how to check isomorphism quickly, but we'll get there. Um, and so all well-tested, one of the things that well-tested means is that in the planar limit, it's provable. And in the non-planar case, we've checked it and we've never found a counterexample. That doesn't mean it doesn't, doesn't mean it's true. Um, so remember that we have these square moves. You can do this inside of a planar graph or a non-planar graph, it makes no difference. And also this, um, the, merge, the merge relation, merge on merge relation. 
Okay, now this definition is a very important and very um, generic and it has nothing to do with planarity, which is that the boundaries of an on, one of these on-shell varieties correspond, so you, you hand me a graph and I can compute the boundary configurations by just finding all the edges that I can, that when I remove them, D, the dimension of the subspace drops by one, exactly one. So that means that if I look at this graph, I, all I, do, I can put this on the computer, I delete every single edge separately. And I say, what is the dimension of the space that survives? Is the, is the resulting diagram reduced or not? And it turns out for this particular example that of all of the many, many edges inside this diagram, only three, you can only remove three of them to result in a reduced um, daughter diagram. And so that means that you can test this because reducibility is something you can very quickly test on a computer. It allows you to identify the removable, so-called removable edges very quickly. They're all the edges that when you delete them results in a still reduced diagram. Okay, now this is um, actually a very powerful tool for a very simple reason. Um, because, and this conjecture I believe is probably not too hard to prove in fact, which is that we'd like to, and this is, this conjecture is going to be our workhorse, which is that two varieties are isomorphic if and only if their boundaries are isomorphic. Now this, this combined with this becomes an extremely powerful workhorse. Why? Because it means that I can take a, a diagram with a lot of edges and I can go to its boundaries. And if its boundaries like here are non-planar graphs, I still don't know how to answer the question yet, but you can always go down deep enough into the boundary structure of, the, of a graph until every single diagram that you have. So if you go deep enough in the boundaries, if you remove enough edges, the graph will have a plane embedding and it becomes a planar diagram with respect to some ordering of the, of the, of the external legs. It doesn't matter what the ordering of the external legs are, because there's a theorem that for planar graphs, the um, every two, two, two planar on-shell diagrams are isomorphic related by moves if and only if the set of vanishing minors are the same. Um, the set of vanishing Pluker, Pluker coordinates are the same. And that means that if you go deep enough down into the boundary structure, it's very easy to test whether or not this, this collection of boundaries are pairwise isomorphic to this collection of boundaries. And that allows you to recursively define equivalence, um, at least this conjecture allows you to recursively define equivalence in terms of planar graphs. Um, and that becomes a real thing. So we, I mean, let's not talk about this, but it's part of the title of this is that I can think about the stratification as the graph generated by all of its bound, iterated boundaries all the way down to zero dimensional cells to empty graphs. Okay. Okay, and we also, and it's important for what I'm gonna show you next that um, we consider two varieties to be equivalent um, if, if they are related by just taking the thing and relabeling, permuting the external uh, labels of the graph. So for example, if you take a planar graph, so all the different permutations of Park-Taylor I would consider equivalent. You take a planar graph and you just change the, perm you permute the labels on the outside of the graph. All of those things describe ordered lists in G2N or on, R, on P1, RP1. Um, and it's just planar with respect to some ordering. So the fact that it's planar or non-planar doesn't really matter. Um, it's just a permutation of the same thing. So we're gonna call two varieties equivalent if you can relabel one. And then this parity thing is actually mostly important for G3.6 in the case that um, for a top dimensional variety is, well, for any variety, if I change all the colors from white to black everywhere and black and vice versa, you get another um, configuration inside the same space inside G3.6. And sometimes those things, um, uh, take you to a new variety, sometimes they don't. And we're going to call two things equivalent if, if this color changing operation, which is called parity, and relabeling things leave them the same. And the point is, is that I'm about to tell you the results of this complete classification. So we analyze this on all the 13, 17 million um, graphs.
The first is that for top dimensional cells, those with um, n hat delta equal to minus one, which is means they're one forms, they're nine dimensional cells inside the Grassmannian. Of all of the graphs you can generate like that, there are only 24 inequivalent classes of top dimensional cells, so not that bad. Um, um, 22 of these are constructible by bridges and two of them are not. And only one of these things is planar. So the positroid variety is exactly one of these 24. When you go down to eight dimensional cells, which would be correspond to functions, these are things with n hat delta equals zero, there's only 10 equivalence classes. And how do you obtain them? You obtain them by boundary elements of any of these 24 things. It's kind of interesting. All of them are bridge constructible. One is planar. And this gives rise to 3,000 distinct functions. But you have all of these identities, these homological identities, meaning that the boundary of any higher dimensional cell adds up to zero. Each one of those things gives you an identity among these 3,000 functions. And this um, results in only a, a space of 434. These are the coefficients of polylogarithms in a non-planar theory to all orders of perturbation theory um, for endpoint amplitudes. These are what are called leading singularities, and it's the class, the vocabulary of on-shell functions that you would need to care about for this theory. Um, at least this is the dimension of the total space. There are seven equivalence classes of seven-dimensional varieties, etc. And we did the whole analysis. Um, and to give you an idea of what these graphs look like, and we constructed them, we drew pictures of them in a way that su easily suggested how they were bridge constructed. So all of these graphs are represent inequivalent on-shell varieties, and we gave particular differential forms for every one of them. Um, but you can easily construct the differential form yourself by just taking these things and adding bridges sequentially. In terms of the functions, these leading singularities, things like terms in BCFW, this is one of those terms in BCFW. It's what we called minor one in the last lecture. It's one particular case, and it's this planar graph. Um, but there are nine others that also exist. And they all, and notice that the C matrices are all the same, but the differential form on them changes. Um, that's kind of interesting. So they can be the exact same point, but they're in a different cell inside the Grassmannian. These are overla overlapping cells. And then there's something with cube roots and two things with square roots in it too, which we would expect to find at two loops and, or three loops and higher in uh, am amplitudes in N equals four. Okay, so I want to end this um, a third part of these lectures. The next lecture, remember, is going to be fairly different. It's a tutorial of some kind um, of Mathematica. But I want to end this, this, this part of these lectures the same way that we started them, which is that there exists this kind of magical correspondence between on-shell diagrams that you can draw and are well-defined for any quantum field theory, but in four-dimensional theories of massless particles, like the standard model, um, there exists this connection between these functions that you might care about and on shell and, and these, this Grassmannian geometry, such that every diagram encodes some subspace in a Grassmannian with some volume form that depends on the theory. And it immediately tells you things, information flows in both directions, that um, homological identities over here give you functional relations, volume preserving diffeomorphisms correspond to symmetries. Um, and there are these important open questions that we don't know the answer to outside of a very few isolated cases. And then the broad class of planar theories of maximum supersymmetry, um, of which there's only one. So I wanna end these lectures with this. I wish I could take your questions, but I understand there'll be some discussions um, soon. And so I hope to meet you all and talk about those um, and uh, answer any questions you might have about the homework in the discussion session soon. I will also um, close this with a small pitch for um, this book. Most of it's available in the archive. It's a, um, see, it's 12.56.05 or something like that on the archive. And um, yeah, anyway, I hope you've learned a little bit about Grassmannian geometry and um, its role in these this class of functions. It's very important to a lot of understanding and of scattering amplitudes. And I look forward to meeting you all very soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>